go and stand so we can sing our first song of the day. Jason, thank you. to, um, he's going to do one message on, um, on the prayer and with the prayer cards. So I just want you to know that there's prayer cards back there. You can um, fill them out and put them into the giving box, which there's the giving box if you're so inclined. Um, that's where you'll be able to find that. Um, there's also the activity tables down there um, in the back. And if you've got announcements like a graduation or a wedding or something like that, you want us to come, that's where you would put that. Um, and as we grow, we're going to also need, you know, people to volunteer. And if you're so inclined to do so, then um, just talk to one of us, talk to Jerry or Carl or me or Debbie or any Mostly of us. Mostly Jerry. Mostly Jerry. Jerry. So, yeah. 
Okay, Pamela. And um, that's all I got for her. I'm sorry, I don't have a little script. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Dear Lord, thank you for for another week and another wonderful day. Thank you for bringing us all here together today to worship you. We pray that while we are here, we leave all of our troubles at the door. And we and we focus on you in this one hour so that we can so that we know that you love us and why we love you. God, today as we hear your message, let us remember that we are saved and it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing to be. And we are so thankful for that, God. Thank you. We just we just love you, God, and we, we pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to ask you guys. Oh, put on through. I'm going to ask you guys to um, maybe do a little bit of finger exercises. If you're if you're in a physical Bible, if you're doing an app, it may not be as bad. But we're going to bounce. There's going to be five, I think, key verses to what we're talking about today. So if you and I really, I honestly believe that when you Follow along as you're reading. As someone's reading, I, ha I think it has more impact. Would you guys agree? And if you don't, just, just let me read to you. That's fine. We're going to start off in Isaiah 26. You don't have to go to Isaiah 26. I would encourage you to go to Ephesians 6. We're going to start in verse 10. But Isaiah 26 sets up Ephesians 6. And Isaiah 26 reads this. And I'm only going to read four verses. So while you're looking, just kind of open your ears. We have a strong city. This is the prophet Isaiah speaking for God, right? This is God's message. We have a strong city. God makes salvation, keyword for the day, its walls and ramparts. Verse 2 says, open the gates that the righteous nation may enter. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds... Oh, Helen, are you there? No. You just knew it. You know this one? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Let that be a lesson, folks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust you. And then verse 4 says, trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. And what I want to focus in on, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast. The mind is a terrible thing. To waste. To waste. Yeah, put that part on the end there. So just a real quick recap in our series, The Armor of God. We've been coming up with some snappy titles for the Belt of Truth. The message was titled The Belt of Truth, the Righteous Breastplate of Righteousness. We call that the Breastplate of Righteousness and so on and so forth. Now today, I'm going to shake it up. It's the Helmet of Salvation. So I thought, wouldn't it be cool to leave you guys with something that just says Helmet of Salvation? So I I titled this message, The Helmet of Salvation. There's no verbal clutter there. We're talking about the helmet. Bernie's going, that's not snappy at all. That's actually what it, you just said. What it was. So if you're in Ephesians 6, we're going to read this. Now, guys, we only get to read this together three more times. This is one of those three. And then Helen already has it committed to memory, but Josh, you'll be expected to be able to recite this on calls. So Yeah, no problem. Okay, we just want to kind of pay attention. Here it is, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his, in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Verse 13, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you, be, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm. Then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, verse 16 says, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all flaming arrows of the evil one. That's what we talked about last week, the flaming arrows. And now this week we add just a few words. Take the helmet of salvation. So the helmet of salvation. When we're thinking of helmets, there's a lot of different types of helmets. There's, what? Spear and magic helmet. There is, there is a spear and magic helmet, Elmer Fudd, 
would be so glad that we referenced that. Are you guys familiar with that Bugs Bunny? Spear magic helmet. And he says, oh, boom, Hilda. Why did you send me off on that? Well, yeah. Um, so yes, there's a spear magic helmet here. There's all that. There's also bicycle helmets that you wear when you're riding a bike. There's motorcycle helmets that you should wear when you're riding a motorcycle. There's football helmets that you would wear when you're playing football. You guys are right in there with me, man. I appreciate it. So Paul is surrounded by Roman soldiers. He's talking about the armor of God. So the helmet that he's describing, or the helmet that he's referencing, would be that of a Roman soldier. Has anyone ever seen a Roman soldier helmet very ornate right through here, a lot of flippies, a little bit of something in the back, and then usually it has this thing they call a crest, and it goes one of two ways. Like if you're a little higher ranked, you're going to get a crest. And, and what this helmet does from a distance, you don't have to be right up on it. From a distance, the helmet has two facets, two duties. Number one, it gives identity. Depending on the metal or the color of your helmet and the direction of your crest, and the color of your crest, it tells you what group you're with and what rank you have. That's really, really interesting, isn't it? From a distance, people can tell who you're with. And I find that really interesting because that's identity. As soon as you put on that Roman helmet, you're part of this massive army. And, and historians believe that the Roman army that we're talking about was one of the amazing, uh, what's, what's unbeatable, like this was the army of all armies. This is the army that you compare other armies to and learn from. So when you had that helmet on, you were part of a force. You were part of a force. And the second thing that that helmet does is safety. Obviously. Otherwise, you could do a lot of identity and stuff with all the other shield, right? But those are the two duties of a helmet to tell who you are and what rank you are and where you belong and instill fear. <laughs> and the second one was for safety. So when you put that helmet on, um, anyone you came in contact knew you were part of something bigger and more powerful. It made the enemy think. Interesting, no? And the same is true today. When we put on certain helmets, we can identify Power, victory. Mm. It was always or something different. Mm. <laughs> so when we're talking about the helmet of salvation, it's not blaspheming to set it on the Bible. I'm just running out of room. This helmet does all that. When you see this helmet, you know that the person wearing this helmet belongs to an army, as it were. One of the most powerful armies ever. Mm. Probably not. <laughs> Jury's still up. But it does also tell you a lot of things. It says you belong to this particular section of the National Football League, the Minnesota section, right? That tells you that. And this face guard also tells you a lot. The kicker, he doesn't get much. The punter, they don't get much. When you see a guy, unless you're Joe Theismann, we know how that went, right? If you see one single, that guy goes out once in a while to kick the football. That's that guy. When you see something along these lines, a little like like heavy vision, you know this is one of the this one of the talented players. This is going to be like a wide receiver, a running back, a quarterback, somebody that needs their wits and eyes, right? When you see that full face guard, it's not like a lot of material right through here. Those are the guys that are in the trenches. Those are the guys that they need a step stool to put it on their head. Those are the big guys that bash every single play, right? So this helmet says who you belong to and what your position is. It is not the helmet of salvation. I mean, it could be someday. Really, someday. Someday. So the same is true today. And the safety is, is pretty obvious, right? The helmet's main safety concern is what? To protect your elbows. No. To protect your head. And what is in your head, that would be your brain. Because one good blow to the head, and we know that we're laying there in a blubbering pile, no good for game, no good for battle, no good really to anyone until you get your wits about you. So it's to protect the head. The helmets protect our minds. Amen? So Paul is telling us to protect our mind, to put on or take up the helmet of salvation. So what is Paul saying? 
find a Minnesota Vikings football helmet? No. He's saying, remember salvation. Remember salvation. Right? The shield was for Satan's arrows that come from a great distance, all those temptations, right, that seemingly come out of nowhere. And let's be honest, okay? If the shield was 100%, we wouldn't need anything else, would we? But things get through, amen? Things get through, and then they fester, and they create thoughts. And Paul says, here's how you stop the thought once it makes it past the shield. If it ever does, it guys, it will. It's the helmet of salvation. So more specifically, remembering salvation. So to be successful in battle against Satan's lies, because that's what Satan does, right? He's the father of lies. He lies. So to be successful in battle against Satan's lies, we make ourselves aware of what we think about. Quite a while ago, Amy did a series on how our brains work and how, how we think. And she had a, she had a sentence in there. Um, I got it last night. I had I, I had a couple more words. Go figure. I made it longer than it should have been. It was think about your thinking. What Paul is saying is exactly what Amy told us two years ago. Think about what you're thinking about. Think about your thinking. Easy, right? I wish. See, protection comes not from what we feel, but from what we know. Protection comes not from what we feel. Our feelings betray us constantly. It's not what we feel. Protection comes from what we know. Mm -hmm. So feelings are why it's so difficult to think the right thing. It's because of our feelings. Last week, Oz and I went to, and if you haven't seen it, I think I can actually endorse this movie. Maverick, Top Gun Maverick. Mm -hmm. Anyone seen it? The sound of, right, there's three of us. The, guys, let's support this movie. The sound effects are awesome. Yeah, nice. Actually, the sound effects were the best part. So I'm sitting in there, and this movie, for those that don't know, this movie is like 30 years after the original Top Gun. Did anyone see the original Top oh, Gun? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I gotta be honest. I was not in love with the original Top Gun. I know, don't judge me. <laughs> I wasn't. But I said, we should, we should go watch, you know, Callie said, oh, Dad, it's so good. So we went, and it was really, really good. And I don't know if it was good because they kept... Like, they unveil, and I don't want to give away the ending, he wins. Um, they take the cover off this Kawasaki crotch rocket, right? And that was, I'm pretty sure, the one in the original. And he has the same jacket, and I was like, I think that's the same jacket. Now, who is that? I don't know. It's okay. Right? They keep bringing things back from the 80s. Why are they doing that? So us old farts will go, oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm hip. I'm hip. And that's sentiment. Sentiment. Sentiment is one of the reasons. Let me tell you this. I left there feeling like I was in high school or early college for sure. I'm like, ah, we should buy a plane. And we should uh, just like <laughs> calm down, let's go get ice cream. That's good too. It's sentiment. Sent the movie is pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. And, and you leave there pretty wound up. Like I remember leaving Star Wars, the original Star Wars, easily that wound up. And all the Rocky movies, I left pretty wound up. Let's find someone to pound on. No, no, no. So uh, most of the time, though, most of the time, we remember events way better or way worse than they were. Our minds are tricky that way. We remember things way better than they were or way worse than they were. And Satan uses this. Do you guys remember, uh, hopefully you do, when the Israelites were in captivity for 400 years, and, and the Bible says, I believe it's in Exodus, they were crying out, God, save us. When will you take us from this misery? Okay? I'll put that in your memory banks. Then God sends Moses, and now they're wandering in the desert. They're free. They're in the desert. And at a certain point, they go, man, I'm so sick of bread every day. I'm so sick of having to follow this cloud during the day and fire at night. I'm so sick of setting up my tent and, right? Gosh, if we could just go back to Egypt where we had it so good. What would Tom Cruise say about that? That's really the question we need to ask here, right? No. They were remembering... They were remembering the good parts. They got to eat something besides bread. The good part. Everything else, they were slaves, forced to work, right? All of them, right? They're forgetting that. They're like, oh man, we had it so good, we should go back to slavery? That's what our minds do. That's one of Satan's tricks. So, and the next thing he does is he uses shame. That's when we remember something way worse than it is 
way worse than it is. See, we tend to see ourselves as a combination of our struggles. And we give ourselves labels. Unfortunately, other people give us labels too. Druggy, drunk, loser, slut, whore, right? Yeah. And then we start to believe that. Because that's what people call us. So those labels aren't take off when you get home. They stick with you and eventually you start to believe you're exactly what people are calling you and that's a failure. So if you're gonna remember one thing from today, remember this sentence, failure is an event, not a person. Failure is an event, not a person. See, we spend a lot of time thinking, at least I hope we do, we spend a lot of time thinking and most of the time we're thinking about ourselves. We're thinking about ourselves. If we're honest, our time initially is based around our needs. Think about when you wake up in the morning, you're planning your day, you're gonna plan your week, you're gonna plan your month. You're planning around whose schedule? You're planning around your schedule. And it's okay to admit this, you guys, because we all do it. I'm not gonna wake up and start planning Joan's schedule unless you ask me to, and it's gonna be wild. It'll be a crazy week. <laughs> we plan our schedule. When we pray, think about our prayer life. When you're alone with God, who are you really praying for? Most of the time, if we're being honest, it's for us, right? So it's natural, it's natural that our thoughts would also be based around us, because we're with us all day. We're literally the only person we're actually supposed to take care of and have any control over. So it's kind of natural that our thoughts and our actions would be based around self. Now watch this. Watch this. The key to joy, the key to peace, is not based in our feelings, our wants, or our desires. The key to joy, the key to peace, the key to happiness <coughs> is in others, serving others, helping others, encouraging others, supporting others, fellowshipping with others. That's the key. See, that's a foreign concept because um, most of the time, we're so geared to think about ourselves, we don't realize that we're making ourselves the focus of our worship. We're making ourselves a little G. We're making ourselves our God, unfortunately. So to be protected by salvation, we need to change our thinking, and, and the Bible calls that transformation, bless you. And last week we talked about the three parts. I believe it was last week, or was it two weeks ago, we talked about um, the spirit, or body, this is body, it's a dad bod, by the way. Um, so there's body, which is flesh, right? And then there's, there's our soul, which is our mind, we're protecting our mind today, and then there's our heart, which is our spirit, okay? so. It starts with the heart. Something has to be in our heart. So our salvation starts with our heart. We say, Jesus, I accept you. I accept what you did for me. I want to be part of your family. I want to live eternal. I want to live like you. I want to be like you. I want a life of joy and peace. Right? That's in our heart. That's the spirit. That's salvation. So we are saved. Then it has to move to the mind. Because you remember, it's first heart, second mind, then body. Body follows where, whatever the mind says. That's where the body's going. Whatever the mind says... So if you need to change your way of thinking, doo -doo, you know you're already going to change the body, then the body's going to follow behind. So once you have it in your heart, Jesus, I accept you as my Savior, you are saved. Amen? Say that. You, you are, are saved. saved. Now we're talking about continual salvation. We're talking about being free from <laughs> sin. So we, we need to bring it to our mind. We need our mind to understand what our heart knows. So unfortunately, we tend to hang on to things that hold us back, sentimentality. And then we remember it with shame. That's 
the roadblock in this 18 inch highway. Is that about 18, would you say? The distance from your heart to your head has a huge roadblock and it's that we remember stuff. And Satan knows that. See, we tend to wanna to hang on to things. We hang on to unhealthy labels, loser, druggy, drunk, slut. We hang on to those because we're never gonna move past that, right? I've been that my whole life. So we hang on to it. We hang on to relationships. Because what would they think if I stopped hanging out with them? Yeah, they're doing stuff that I know I'm not supposed to do. I know it's bad for me. But what are they going to say about me? Do you want to know what God says? Who cares? Who cares? But we hang on to that. Do you guys know how to make, Joan, I know you do, and Carol, I'm positive you know Helen for sure, but this is, Chris, of course, pancakes. There's some main ingredients in pancakes. What's one of the main ingredients? Egg, flour, a little bit of sugar, a lot of milk, a little bit of salt, depending, right? Uh, and some baking soda or powder. One of those two. One of the bakings, right? It's just a little bit of that, right? So you make pancakes. Every time you put those ingredients together, it's eggs, flour, milk, salt, sugar, maybe a little bit of vanilla for taste, okay? Yeah. Some chocolate chips, everyone's mom. Cinnamon. 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 Cinnamon, sure. Cinnamon. Okay, easy, folks, easy. Blueberry. Basic pancake, right? <laughs> These lovely little slabs of light that are just waiting to be drenched in maple. Oh, come on. Right, so when you find out pancakes are bad for you, and eventually your doctor is going to say, if you have my doctor, which by the way, I'm looking for a new doctor. My doctor said you may be eating a little too many pancakes. Okay, so I need to change my ways. He suggests an omelet would be a healthier choice because you got to eat breakfast, right? How do you make an omelet? Eggs, same way. huh? The same way. The kind of, yeah. yeah. Eggs, milk, milk cheese, cheese, salt, pepper, bacon. salt and pepper. Bacon. Okay, we get the idea. Okay, right. So when I'm going to make my omelet, and I put in, well, I'm gonna add more egg because pancakes only have one egg. I'm gonna add. I'm pretty hungry. Two eggs, and my flour, and my milk and my salt, what do I end up with? Do I end up with an omelet? No, it's a mess. It's not even a pancake. So hold it, hold it, hold it. That didn't work. I'm gonna add another egg. I'm gonna cut back the flour by a couple spoons, okay? I'm gonna cut back the milk a little bit because I've made pancake soup and that was no good, right? And then I get ready and bake it. Do I have an omelet yet? No. I do not. How do I expect to get an omelet when I'm keeping the flour and I'm keeping all the milk and I'm only adding a little bit of egg? I lost my, oh my gosh, I gotta flip the page. So roasted pancakes. You can't keep using, watch this. You can't keep using the same ingredients and get a different meal. You cannot keep using the same ingredients and get a different meal. So there are things you need to increase. If you're moving from a pancake to an omelet, you increase the eggs. Certainly increase the eggs. And that would be prayer time, fellowship with, fellow, with believers, reading your Bible, listening to Christian music, podcasts, right? You need to limit some things. We don't need all the milk we need for pancakes. We just need a little bit of milk. And that might be um, your old hangouts. Maybe you can't go to your old hangouts all the time, okay? Radio stations, maybe you, maybe you can't listen to the same radio stations, the same songs you did growing up. Because we're nostalgic. See, we go back there. It's gonna bring us back, so we need to limit our milk. And then there are things you just need to do away with. If you're making an omelet, how much flour do you need? The answer is none flour, <laughs> none flour. Put the flour away, we're making an omelet. But no, put it away. And flour would be the things that we're trying to hang on to, the things that we think are our identity, nicknames, groups that we hung out with. Not your nickname, honestly. Right? We have to get, there are things that we have to get rid of. Habits. 
sometimes it's a job, sometimes it's best friends. Man, if they're weighing you down, you've got to cut anchor, right? That's never fun. That's never fun. You will not get the desired blessing until salvation reaches your head. So when you're moving from the pancake to the omelet, right? You have to do whatever it takes because you will not get the desired blessings until salvation reaches your head. When we see in our mind what we know in our hearts has been done and is continuing to be done. When we see that in our mind that we already know in our heart. We see it in our mind. What follows the mind? The body. I just don't know. I just I struggle with sin. I struggle with all this temptation. I struggle, struggle, struggle. Well, where's your freaking mind? Let me follow you for a week. Make some notes. We'll have something to talk about. I guarantee it. Until we transform our mind, we will continue to wrestle with our flesh. And Satan tries to convince us that being a Christ follower is limiting. It's like a prison. That's what he tries to convince us. Holy cow, there's ten commandments. Takes all the fun out of life. Can I tell you this? We need boundaries. We are freer with boundaries than without. And this is a perfect example. How many people have ever pulled a fish up and took the hook out and dropped it in the boat or dropped it on shore? Does the fish look like he's free? Does it look like he's enjoying himself? He's going, what, 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 right? It's like, oh, free yourself, little fish, fly away. The fish is freer in the water. He knows it, you know it, everyone knows it. A train. Oh, that track is so limited. You can only go 11,000 miles throughout the United States. It's so limited. Take a train off the track one time. Is it free? Train needs a track. Fish need the water. We need boundaries. We are freer within our boundaries. So think about times in your life where you feel like you have been derailed or pulled from the water. So you have that vision. Let me ask you this. Is it possible that that situation may have been made different if God's boundaries were actually taken into consideration? Because what we want to do all the time, we want to go, I don't have a choice. Look where I am. I don't have, I don't, me, 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 right? How did you get there? Go far enough back. You stepped across the boundary somewhere and just kept going. Amen? Amen? We need to change our thinking as followers of Christ. So Ephesians 4, if you're in Ephesians 6, go back two chapters. This is Ephesians 4. And this is the third one in our group of five. Ephesians 4.17 says, So I tell you this and insist on it. This is Paul speaking to the church of Ephesus. I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Verse 19, having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so that is to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. Verse 20, that however is not the way of life you learned. But when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, here it is, to put off old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Our bodies want sin. That's the way we lean. Luckily, they're third in the chain. Heart, mind, body. Where the mind is, that's where the body goes. See what we're getting out of this? And it says, be made new. Here it is, 23. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created, by, uh, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So it says, no longer live in the futility, useless thinking. No longer living in useless thinking. Think about what you think about. And, and this verse says they've given themselves over to the impurity and greed. That's something that has grown. I'm 54 years old, soon to be 55. 54 years of creating the person standing before you. If I want to change something, it probably isn't going to happen overnight. Don't give up. The Bible says don't give up. Amen? 
because it took a process to build you, it's gonna be a process to tear you down a little bit. And is God afraid to tear you down? Nope. He's not afraid to tear you down. When you're standing there going, why me? I'm in this valley. And God is going, you're almost there. You're up. Start digging. We need you a little lower. You're a slow learner, Carl. Right? He's not afraid. He's not afraid to let us go. So they've given themselves over. And then it says to be made new in the attitude of what? Our minds. We can control our minds. We can have a new way of thinking. We cannot use as an excuse. The devil made me do it. It's just the way I am. I've been called this my whole life. That's what I am. Imagine if your nickname was Stinky. You'd never have to shower. But I mean, you could shower anytime you want. But I don't because my nickname is Stinky. Luckily, my nickname was not Stinky. I mean, it could have been. There was a period of three years, but it was college. All right. So how do we make this transformation? Because that's key, right? If we need to transform our mind, we need to know how to make this. So now we're going to go to 2 Corinthians. And I'm sorry for bouncing you guys around, but you're going to see a connection here. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. So the third chapter of 2 Corinthians, verse 18. It says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Should I read that one more time for you? Yes. It says, And we, who all with un unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing ever glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Unveiled faces is humility. And so many times we think of being humble or, or uh, humility as kind of downplaying our Oh, man, you're a really good basketball player. Oh, thanks. It's nothing. You know, I just throw a ball. That's all I do. Oh, well, you're a really good singer. Oh, this old thing? You know, whatever. But humbleness is also being open about your weakness. Do you think God wants us to come before him so he can tell us what a great car player we are, what a great basketball player we are? Or does God want us to come before him with us saying, Here's my problem areas that I've identified. What do you think? Humility, unveiled faces. It's being honest about your weakness. And to be honest about your weakness, you have to kick pride in the pants. Because it's not easy to say I need help. It's not easy to say I'm failing. It's not easy to say I can't do this. If you grew up in this area, the Midwest, you don't ask for help. You dig in, you try harder. Let me ask you this. Does that work? Has it ever worked? It doesn't. It doesn't. So we're to contemplate, contemplate the Lord's glory. That's what we're supposed to do, to transform our thinking. It says, contemplate the Lord's glory. So the first thing we contemplate, who is the Lord? Well. He's our Savior, and we need to literally wrap our heads around this, that Jesus is our Savior. We cannot save ourselves. We need Jesus. Amen? I hope we all know that. We cannot save ourselves. We can try, and we will fail. And we can try harder, and we will fail. You cannot save yourself without Jesus. Amen? Amen. We need Jesus. So we're, we need to know who he is. Now we know who he is. We need to know what he did. Jesus allowed himself to be killed for us. So hear this. His death saved us from the penalty, the first P, the penalty of sin. His death saved us from the penalty of sin. We are no longer expected to pay for that. It's paid, the penalty. And it also reconnected us with God. That's what he did. His death paid the penalty and reconnected us with God. Then, what he continues to do. This is all part of salvation. What does he continue to do? His life saves us from the power of sin. When we connect ourselves to Jesus' life, when we say, you're the vine, we're the branch, when we're connected, he says, you can't lose. You can't lose. You stay connected to me, you can't lose. I will get you away from sin. 
I will take away the power of sin. Stay connected to me and sin will no longer be your master. Okay? So the penalty and the power. And then what he's already done in the future, what we have hope in, what we have expectation in, is his resurrection saves us from the presence of sin. When we die, we are also resurrected and we will be glorified. That's called glorification and there will be no sin. So he saves us from the presence of sin. Amen? Amen. Penalty, power, and presence. So when we think of salvation, when we think of Jesus, we now know we're saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. Salvation. That's what we think about. Think about what you think about. We have our past is gone. Don't need to think about it. Our present is secure. We're good. And the future is certain. Amen? Mm -hmm. We are transforming into his image, becoming more and more like Christ. We are transforming into his image, becoming more and more like Christ. Number four, and our verses go to Philippians 4, and I'll give you a second to get there. This is Philippians 4, verse 4. You there? Enough people there? You can follow along in your head. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. When should we rejoice? Always. always. I'll say it again. When? Always. 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 Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious. Ah, do not be anxious. Why? Because the present and the future are already settled. It's already settled. Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So, Jeff, you're struggling. Where do I go with this? Oh, to God. Bernie's struggling. Where do we take this problem? To God. Where should we take it first? To God. More often than not, where do we take it? I'll handle this. I'll do this. I got a friend that can help me. When you've exhausted everyone in your Rolodex, if there even still is a Rolodex, you know, God, I don't know. I mean, is there anything you can do? I was like, hey, about time. All right, now. And then verse 7 says, And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds. Dun, dun, dun. In Jesus Christ. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there's anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And then watch this line. Whatever you have learned or received or heard, from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. So there's a list there. If we're supposed to think about, dwell on things we fantasize about, it says, think about these things. It says, think about what is true. That means there's also, if there's something that's true, that means there's something that's false. There are lies. We tend to want to think about the lies. Why? So think about the truth, not the lies. And I don't need to give you examples of what lies are because we think about them all the time. And it says, think about what is noble. If there's something that's noble, that means there's something that's dishonorable. Boy, it's a lot easier to join a gossip group of dishonor than it is honor. What are you guys talking about? We're just talking about what a great person that guy that just left it. Oh, really? Um, okay, cool. Yeah, keep going. How, how many times do you join a group of people I'm mean, going to use the word cackling. I hope that doesn't stereotype anyone. And it's nothing but positive things. Not very often. Think about what's noble, not dishonorable. Okay? If there's something that's right, there's obviously something that's wrong. We all know something that's wrong. We tend to head towards that, don't we? It says don't. Think about something that's pure. If there's something that's pure, the opposite of that would be dirty. Right? I don't need any examples. Do you need examples? No. Helen's thinking them right now. Helen, knock it off. <laughs> if there's something that's lovely, there's also something that's ugly. Man, we lean towards ugly. And Satan knows it. He doesn't even have to push. He says, I'll meet you there. 
If there's something that's admirable, that means there's something deplorable. Right? What way do we tend to think? Just think about that. If there's something that's excellent, that means there's something that's inferior. God says stick with the excellent. If you stay on this side, your body's going to follow. Amen? Something that's praiseworthy. If there's something that's praiseworthy, there's also something that's disgraceful. Yeah, but if I'm just copying and pasting, it's not really mine. Uh, yeah, it is. Your name is at the very top. That means everything below this belongs to you. Interesting. So the three keys to transformation, there's only three. And I'll go through them quickly, real quickly. Number one is, and we talked about earlier, the key to transformation, real transformation, mind-altering transformation. The key, are you ready? Not living for yourself. We can stop right there. We're not going to, but we could. Not living for yourself. That's our, that's our project for the week. By next Saturday, we will all come in having lived for everybody else. We will be joyous, peace-filled, and happy. Amen? You really can do it. Mm. Problem is, Satan gets in there and says, you don't really want to do it. You don't owe them. Right? Living for others is tough. But think about how that would look. If in a marriage, I lived with my wife above me, and she lived with me above her. We're both there for each other. Would you ever be able to decide where to go eat? Oh, I don't care. Where do you want to go? Oh, I don't care. Wherever you want to go. I don't, who should drive? Oh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, is that <laughs> Actually, that is a conversation that we have with Jerry about every Saturday. Where do you want? Oh, I don't care. Just wherever. Should we go to Subway? Yeah. <laughs> How about Applebee's? I went there two days ago. Olive Garden? Wherever you guys want to go. It's funny because it's true, Jerry. It's funny because it's true. All right. So number one, not living for yourself. Man, easier said than done, but Jesus says you can do it. You just need to get rid of, let go of what? What's the key thing there? Yourself. Get over yourself. I love you, but you're not that important. That's what he's saying. Right? The second thing, remember you're not alone. Because, man, that's one of Satan's biggest tools. You're not alone. Yeah, you are. Do you see anyone else around here? Where's this God you've been praying to? I don't see him. Do you have everything you wished you had when you were a kid? I don't see it. You're alone. No one's coming to help. That's what he wants us to believe. But scripture tells us we are not alone. God has promised he will never leave us. Jesus said, I will be by your side. When? When for how long? Forever and forever. Go to forever and then go forever past forever. That's a mighty long time. And I'm here to tell you, whoop, there's something else. No! Right? Forever and ever. And your church family is a physical presence of God. Your church family should love you so much they don't allow you to be alone. Your church family should love you so much they do not allow you to listen to, believe, and repeat the lies. But we do because we don't want to interfere. We do, don't we? It's easier to say, hey, I'm there for you, when you're a thousand miles away. It's harder when they're in the bathroom. I'm, I'm here for you. How long are you going to be? Got stuff to do. So that's second. And then third is really kind of a no-brainer, but we kind of forget. The way to transform your mind, don't give up. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, a lot of people think, oh, that's done. It's a rough road. Can I just tell you, that's the beginning? That's the beginning. And is it going to be smooth sailing? Absolutely not. Is it going to be easier than what you just left? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You just got a target on your back. This is not a sales pitch. To, for, so you want to be a Christian? Put the shirt on. It's a target. Get out there, you goofball. Don't give up. Don't give up. When you accept Jesus, you're just getting started. Um, I don't know if they still have them, but, but when I was growing up, you could go to the circus, and they had live animals, right? 
Do they still have that where they bring the elephants out? Does anyone know? I was lucky enough, and I don't know if it was lucky for the elephants, but I got to go backstage, or back in the, where, yeah, the elephants are back there smoking weed. Oh, man, no, it wasn't that kind of backstage. They had all these massive elephants tied up, and it's kind of eerie. Have you ever seen elephants in captivity? They do this to keep the blood flowing, and they all do it together. And that massive weight, you're like, whew, and they kind of look at you like, shoot me. I mean, that's kind of what they're looking like. But when you look at their foot, here's this massive animal. I have no idea how much an elephant weighs, but it's a lot. About 9,000 pounds. 9,000 pounds. Rumor has it. Thank you, Rumor. So that's, wow, four and a half tons. Okay, so that's way more than I even thought it was. So stay clear of the bottoms of it. Right, so when you look at a nine, what is it, 9,000 pounds? 9,000 pound animal, and they're held in the corner. You ever look at this? By a rope around their foot. One foot rope, it's a pretty good size rope, but let's not kid ourselves. All the elephant would have to do is accidentally sway a little too far and go, well, would you look at that? But they don't. Do you know why they don't? Because when they're very little, when they're not 9,000 pounds, when they're 900 pounds, maybe even less than that, but what are they born at? Do you know? I think between 350 and 400. 350, 400. So, boom, out comes Dumbo. And they say, we need to start control. It's from a great height, too, and elephant's rear end is up here. So they drive a stake in the ground, and they put a chain around the 350, 400-pound elephant. And of course, the elephant goes, well, what's going on here? How come I can't go over there? And they continue to do that until they finally give up. And they say, as long as there's something around my foot and it's attached to that stake, I'm stuck. And they don't even continue making it bigger as they get bigger. Big elephants are held in place by a rope. Small elephants are held in place by a chain. So what the elephant is thinking, it's convinced that the stake that's always held him prisoner is going to continue to hold him prisoner because it's there. So we don't want to make that mistake. Don't become a prisoner thinking the same thing that's held you back is going to continue holding you back. Don't be a prisoner thinking what's always held you back is going to continue to hold you back. It doesn't have to, amen? See, we are saved. We are being saved and will continue to be saved. Jesus says, I'm working on you. Don't give up. One more verse, Romans 5, and then I will be done, I promise. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with our God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We've been justified. When we said, Jesus, I accept you, we now have peace with God. That's what we need to remember. Uh, through, through is a combination of through and whom. Through, <laughs> it's just a time saver. I'm trying to get out of here, right? <laughs> through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance perseverance character and character hope and hope does not put us to shame because god's love has been poured out into our hearts through the holy spirit who has been given to us it's in our heart get it to our head so the results of salvation the results of salvation really quickly number one these verses say we have peace with God. When we wrap our brain around that, what's being done, what's been done, and what continued, will continue to be done for us, that's something to have hope in, amen? amen? That's something to hang your hat on, amen? It says we will have peace with God, and then it says we will stand in grace. We have full access to the creator of the universe. Anytime, anywhere, about anything, we can go to him. And humbly say, I'm stuck. I'm at a roadblock. I need help. Anytime. And the third thing is we will rejoice in hope. And this is not the, oh, I hope it doesn't rain. It's not that kind of hope. This is a confident expectation. 
because it is going to happen. Amen? Amen. Wearing the armor of God. Salvation says you cannot lose. You cannot lose. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for this time. And I would just ask God that as the band's coming up and we're getting ready to sing another worship song to you, that with this time that we have kind of quiet and just sitting, you'd make your presence known and search our heart, search our mind for whatever lie we're focusing in on that's holding us back, creating fear, creating doubt, creating denial, destroying part of our relationship with you. And it's going to be different for every single person here. It might be a habit. It might be a relationship. It might be a job. It might be entertainment choices it might be something that we've been brought up believing and, and we know it's just not right it's just been kind of bred into us and those moments can seem insurmountable God help us to remember that you promise to get us through this we stay attached, you get us through. And it's so easy to throw our hands in the air and walk the other direction when all we need to do is throw our hands at our sides and walk towards you. God, we love you. And we thank you for all the blessings you pour upon us, those that we know and even those that are unknown. Help us not be selfish. Help us be good stewards of all the things you've given us. That we can look at everybody else and think, how can I help them? How can I help them? Thank you, God, for this time we have with you. We love you and pray this in the name of your son. Amen. Amen. As we stand for our last song, it would be wonderful.